Hi, my name is Emily Ionelli, and I went to the city uh, yesterday to see my endocrinologist, and also because I'm getting ready for the surgery, male to female transgender bottom surgery. Um, this will be my fifth attempt. Um, so far, so good. Despite the fact that I've gone through a traumatic uh, event recently with um, a car accident, but I spoke to my psychiatrist and I spoke to the endocrinologist and we're all on board for the surgery. They know because I missed it so many times and it would be a shame if I had to miss it again. So that's what we're working towards. I have a date, uh, September 10th. I have uh, insurance approval. Um, I still have to go for a pre-surgery screening test where I guess they do an inventory of, uh, I guess, testing, blood levels, all that stuff to make sure that I'm medically cleared to physically go through the surgery and I don't even get a call from the hospital until the day before the surgery which is kind of strange but I need to have that information so I know when I have to be there uh, make arrangements on how to get there um, maybe by Uber or something and uh, know exactly when to leave in the morning. Uh, if I decide to go by Long Island Railroad, I'm sure I'm gonna have to catch an early train. I know one of my friends who had surgery at Mount Sinai had to be there like at 5.30 a.m. So I'm thinking if I needed to get there by the same time, I'd have to catch the Long Island Railroad roughly around, uh, three-ish, 3.30, and I've never been on the Long Island Railroad at that hour of the morning. That's quite early. And uh, I can't drive there because I park at Target, so they may uh, ticket my car and it's a new car, or tow it, I can't deal with that. So I need exercise anyway, so I'll just walk it from Levittown to Hicksville. Uh, maybe it'll also help me with the anxiety uh, because, you know, I'll be constantly thinking about the surgery and something to worry about initially. As long as everything goes right, I'm hopeful that will be the case. But, you know, I've been waiting for this for a long time, maybe since I was 16, and now it's finally coming to reality almost I mean I have to keep my fingers crossed because this is now like the fifth try so if it doesn't go through then I just give up on it you know they say win is never quit quit is never win but five times and I'm still unable to do it then that's it so it just has to be the the one you know if it's gonna happen so I hope everything goes well with the, the pre-screening test, you know. I hope that uh, I get over this car accident thing that's still in my head. I'm still somewhat afraid to drive. So, um, you know, I'm tackling it one day at a time. You know, I know I have to drive. And then I got financial responsibilities that I'm trying to stay on top of. And uh, you know the deal, life is complicated. You have so many things going on, you know? Plus to struggle with your gender for the whole, your life, your whole life basically. And now at 58, finally coming to the realization that my body will be consistent now with what I feel up here and it's kind of surreal you know I, I mean I know pre-op 
trans women, I know post-op trans women, I know pre-op trans women that are not going through the surgery, I know pre-op pre trans women that are going through the surgery, and I'm a pre-op trans woman that is hopefully going through the surgery because I know what it's like to be postponed or canceled. So right now I'm still a pre-op. I know some post-op trans women and they seem to be doing fine. They're happy with the results. So I assume that will be the case with me if I'm lucky enough to go through the surgery. I have a lot of things on my mind now. I have my son on my mind because of his autism. I have this whole car issue on my mind with the insurance and settlements. And if I'm gonna still owe on the car, I am dealing with my mortgage going up $300 additionally in, uh, in the month. Uh, so that's all right now. It's gone from 2200 a month to 2500 a month. And the fact that I don't even get a full write off anymore of the real estate tax and the state tax, yet the real estate tax goes up every year is really getting me upset. You know, we were duped. And I knew it because I'm a CPA or a former CPA. So I knew that this was a ruse. And it was aimed just for the rich and uh, corporations. We got screwed. Part of my French, but we did. I got screwed at least. I've never paid more income tax in my life than I did this year, according to the Trump Republican tax cuts for the middle class. What a load of hogwash that was. So, uh, you know, all these expenses are going up. My disability income is flat. You know, and unfortunately, I'm not able to get a, a, a working situation where I can make more than what I get. So I'm going to catch 22. And I'm not asking for pity. I'm not asking for sympathy. I'm just stating the facts. And I'd like to know if people out there who are transgender, women, uh, or trans men too, but... I would assume more trans women have more difficulties unless they're super successful uh, and are accepted. Uh, it seems to me that uh, we're just like brushed under the carpet and it doesn't matter how skilled we are, it doesn't matter how competent we are, you know, I mean, I, I know just as much in accounting as a female that I knew as a male. Yet I'm discriminated now because, not because I'm a female, but because I'm a transgender female that I get discriminated against. And I'm just fed up, you know? And uh, I'm dealing with also depression. I have bipolar disorder. You know, you know I, I've said it. I'm not afraid to talk about it because hopefully I may help people. So if I tell the truth instead of sugarcoating things, Maybe other people will kind of see that there are people struggling, yet they're trying to do the best they can. And that's my case, basically. Because, look, I lost my parents both to mental illness. Sadly, I lost my dad to suicide. I lost my nephew, 26, to a, a heroin overdose. I lost my cousin on my father's side to suicide. Um, you know, I've been in the hospital for an uh, overdose in January. Um, you know, it's like a, a bad situation. And my doctor said to me, you cannot prolong, you can't uh, extend that. You know, you have to be firm and strong and not get that mentally ill where you get to that low point. So I have a good team of doctors that are working with me, and they're also concerned about my need for transgender surgery. They want to make sure I'm going to be fine in the recovery. They want to make sure that I'm mentally capable of going through this surgery. Um, it is considered a major surgery. 
And they want to make sure that I can get adjusted to a more feminine body now. You know, because I've lived as a woman, identified, but it had a male body. So now they want me to make sure that this is what I want, you know, because I would, I haven't had sex anyway for a long time. And I'm not trying to get personal here, but I'm very uh, naive, you know. Yeah. I was just fortunate with the half a dozen times I did have sex that I, uh, what my wife got pregnant um, with our little escapades or whatever you want to call it, even though I haven't had much. I was almost a 40-year-old virgin, but I beat the beat him by three years, 37-year-old virgin. And then my wife got pregnant, and then Matthew was born, and uh, that was it because he has autism, and my wife shut me out. I was hoping for a boy and a girl, but it wasn't meant to be. And my son sometimes says, I wish I had a sibling, brother or sister. So, you know, it hurts, you know, it, it hurts. But what can I do? So, um, you know, I'm doing the surgery to feel whole, you know. I'm not curious about having sex like a woman would have with a man. That's not me. You know, I'm doing this more just for my identification as a as a, a transgender woman. You know, and uh, you know, I know some transgender women who uh, swore that they were uh, lesbian. You know. It's hard to explain all this, but they are identify as women, but they're attracted to women, so I get it. So technically, if they're identified as women, and they like women, then they're lesbian. Uh, same thing with trans men. If a trans man likes to be with... Uh, another trans man or a man, then that's considered gay. If a trans man is uh, attracted to a woman, whether a trans woman or a cis woman, then that's considered heterosexual. It's confusing to the people out there who are cis gender because, you know, they just don't understand that. Um, in my case, I consider myself pansexual. And you're probably all wondering what the hell I'm talking about. Well, people equate pansexual with bisexual, which to me isn't right. It may be considered that. But in my case, when I say pansexual, what I mean is that I appreciate a person for who they are, whether it's with a, 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 a woman a transgender woman, a man, or a transgender man, and it has nothing to do with sex. It's strictly that you enjoy their company, and you have fun, and there is no sexual height, uh, pressure, anxiety, nothing like that, because it's not a sexual relationship. It's just you like to hang out. Like I have a friend, Chase. He's uh, female to male. So he's a trans male, and I am a trans woman. Just because he's a trans male and I'm a trans female and we're hanging out together doesn't mean we're a couple. We're just friends. So I like Chase, and we have a reciprocal uh, friendship. So to me, that's pansexual because there's no sexual attraction. It's just friends, like a, a typical guy and girl. It, it's like a platonic, like a friendship. And that's the same with me and my transgender male friend. It's strictly a, a pansexual or platonic relationship, however you want to call it. And I, um, if you pressed me for who I 
would rather be if, in theory, I wanted to have some form of a relationship. I would still be um, attracted to females for many reasons. You know, the idea of being with a man, even though now I have more of a body consistent to a woman, just doesn't turn me on at all. You know, I, I like guys just like as friends, basically, but not for any sexual reasons. First of all, and I don't want to get graphic. But when I, when I picture women, you know, like uh, lawyers or accountants or librarians or nurses or doctors, I cannot envision in my mind uh, oral sex. I, I just, I can't envision it, like where a woman would be... Um, I don't know how to explain it because I never have experienced it and I never will and I never don't want I never want to but when they like they say go down on someone I I just I can't envision that like yeah I can't even think about that and I never watch a pornographic movie in my life but they have scenes like that where women do things like that and I just can't like when I see a woman and I'm trying to think that this is possible that these women do that stuff it just like throws me out of whack like how could they do that so I don't know I, I, I'm not ever interested in something like that and uh, certainly no sex either strictly just friendship I'm not really into sex People think I'm crazy, you know, because the world revolves around sex. And it really doesn't in some people's cases, like mine, you know. I'm glad I had the little sex that I did have because it allowed me to have a son and Matthew. But we didn't do anything, like, off the wall. We just had typical intercourse. That was it. Um... And believe me, I've seen trans women videos where they get very graphic about sex. Like this is rated like uh, PG, what I'm talking about. But oral sex, I don't even get that. You know, I was very naive when they say oral sex, I thought it meant two, like a male and a female kissing each other. That's what I thought. I didn't think it was something else that relates to down there. So, I don't even want to go there. But, uh, yeah, I got to get used to the, the feminine, uh, feminization of my body. You know, I have to uh, start doing things like maintenance, like dilating. And I understand that's like a hassle, but you have to do it. Because if you don't, you risk the vagina closing up because according to what my surgeon said it's like when you have a wound the body naturally heals itself so that's quite possible that if you have now a vagina which you never had before through inversion of the penal shaft you uh, risk if you don't dilate that the vagina opening will cl close up and seal. And then if you ever did want to have sex with a guy, you wouldn't be able to because your vagina would not be functional. So the idea for a trans woman who's interested in uh, having sex specifically with men is that she needs to dilate on a regular basis so she can experience the depth and make sure it doesn't close. So then if she wants to have the pleasure of a male in bed, then they have intercourse, just like any male and female, because now a transgender woman is uh, on the outside looking like a woman, even though she doesn't have a uterus, ovaries, uh, uh, 
all, uh, all those female parts that are involved in the reproductive system. And I don't ever think, at least in our generation, that they will have a transgender male to female surgery where they could even uh, provide the opportunity of a transgender woman giving birth. That's like at least uh, over 100 years from now, maybe. I have no idea. Maybe 20 years, or who knows. But it's beyond our generation. So, um, yeah, I'm like excited, a little nervous. You know, I've been through this five times now, getting my hopes up, only to have them come crashing down. So I can't do it again, you know? It's either now or never, you know? And maybe surviving that car accident, I'm not being over dramatic, but if you look at my car and you see the damage, knowing that I was going at some 40 miles an hour, I'm lucky I swerved around the car in front of me but I still made contact with trees and it did a lot of damage to my car. And if I was, instead of trees hitting a brick wall, I would be dead. So, or if I hit the car in front of me, I would be dead and maybe they would be too. So I'm just grateful that I didn't get any worse than just me totaling the car, which I'm very guilty about. And I keep apologizing to the insurance company in Toyota, but, uh, they're trying to set me on the right track and say accidents happen and you got to go on in your life, you know. Just can't let this ruin your life. So that's where I stand with that. But I'm still not comfortable driving a lot. Like I'm doing it only as needed. But anyway, after surgery I won't be able to drive anyway for like two or three months, so... You know, and I'm most likely not even going to be able to go to the 40-year high school reunion. I was kind of wanting to go, but, you know, I, I'm not going to go if I'm going to be in pain. You know, uh, it just doesn't make sense. So, um, I just want things to go well, and then I want to help my son with his situation. You know, and transgender women think once you have this surgery, it's like a miracle and your life is going to be perfect and no more problems because now you look and feel exactly what your mind says. So it's gender dysphoria when uh, surgery helps with that, like hormones do in the beginning. And then uh, hormones can only go so far. Like, I've had a positive experience with hormones because, you know, as a guy, I never had a chest. Now I have a chest, you know, and when I wear my dress, you can see the, the development, you know, and my skin is soft everywhere, down in my legs, in my uh, backside, very soft. Uh, and that's pretty cool because I never had that feeling as a guy. When I was a guy, I had like hair on my face. It was awful. I had like stubble and I had a uh, five o'clock shadow. And no matter how much I shaved, it was like growing back, you know, but I still never got finished with the electrolysis because I still have hair around this part of my lip and below the lip. But my face in general is fine. The electrolysis worked. I've done it for four years. Unfortunately, we didn't finish the job. And now, with all my financial issues, I just can't afford the $70 a week sessions. So hopefully I can do it, but uh, it doesn't look likely right now. And uh, the surgery will help me. You know, even though I have some anxiety, it will make me feel more comfortable with myself. And once I get through the recovery process and things start to come back into normalcy, if you can call it that, and I'm getting used to dilating, you know, I'm not saying that I wouldn't be curious about what it feels like 
to have someone penetrate. I am not saying that I don't want to have that feeling, but it doesn't really matter to me. But I do have a few transgender women friends who also were like turned off to the idea of having a relationship with a male. Whereas if I have a relationship with a male, trans male or a genetic male, I'm more into just friendship because I'm married and I'm loyal and uh, I have my son that I'm worried about and we have to work together to get him in the right situation. So I'm not selfish, I'm not thinking of myself, I'm not thinking of getting pleasure. I'm more looking for just friendship, you know? It has nothing to do with sex. But with that said, my transgender women friends swore they would only be with women. They did get divorced from their wives though, but they swore that they would only have in, uh, relations with women. And it's funny, uh, I, I'm not gonna laugh now, but it was funny when I first heard it, that one of my transgender friends has a boyfriend now. A uh, transgender woman has her boyfriend. And I believe maybe they're having some, uh, whatever you wanna call it. And now I also have another transgender woman friend who's now engaged to a man and she's like looking for wedding dresses and all so it's weird you know they say that they are going to live as lesbians and then all of a sudden they fall for men and now they're doing what women do they uh, have sex they want to get married they want to wear wedding gowns so it's all like crazy to me. Whereas me, I don't look at it like that. I guess I'm like a strange transgender woman or whatever, because I, I don't care about sex. I, I don't I care like about friendships, you know? And my son is on my mind 24 seven. So I wouldn't feel right pleasing myself when I'm worried about my poor son and his difficulties, you know? I have to really focus on him, you know? And there are some people that judge me and say I'm being selfish because all I care about is having surgery and they don't really know what I've been through all my life. So I just tune them out or I just ignore them or I just don't have any relations with these people. You know, who are they to judge me? You know, I don't go judging people. You know, and my most favorite friends, I mean, I have some uh, uh, genetic women friends and genetic male friends who are great, you know, they're wonderful people. They accept me, you know. They may not understand what I'm going through, but they accept me and they embrace me and they don't criticize me. They don't look at me like I'm crazy. Uh, and then I have even my sisters. They don't like talk to me. They ignore me. And I had some friends who I thought were good friends who don't even talk to me anymore. They don't even care. I got into this car accident. Nobody even cared. And they're friends with me. Or they maybe they're not friends with me on Facebook. But I know my sisters. Well, one of my sisters. The other one kind of... Uh, unfriended me, so I don't know if she sees my posts. But when I posted car accident scene, my other sister who does, uh, we're still friends on Facebook, she'll go and compliment someone for a dog that they bought, like a puppy dog, or she'll be grieving because let's say their dog died, you know? And then I post pictures of my car accident and uh, none of my family relatives recognized it. You know, they didn't even care, it seemed. My sister didn't say anything about it. I would have thought maybe they said, are you okay? Oh my God, your car looks like it was totaled. Nothing, you know? And But yet, and I, and I take joy 
in when my cousins get married. I take joy in when they have a baby. You know, I'm one of the first to acknowledge it and send my congratulations and uh, happiness for them. But do they care? Like I was in an accident, I could have died. Do they care? No. They don't say anything. I only had one cousin, just one cousin, who was worried about me. That's it. Out of like uh, over 30 cousins who are, we have some relationship on Facebook. And it's like they could care less. I, even if I died, they probably wouldn't care. You know, this world is messed up when you have relatives that don't even care about you. They care more about a dog that dies than they care about you, like my sister. It just is crazy. I don't understand why society is so screwed up, why we have uh, all these issues where we have to struggle and we have to pay the price because we're just trying to live the way we feel. You know, I had a great experience before that horrible car accident where I went to a college, I mean, a, a reunion with my cross country teammates and our coach. We celebrated our coach because he was a wonderful man. He trained us, he was a mentor to us, especially to me. I was a JV runner, junior varsity. And he treated me just like he did his elite runners on the varsity team. Nobody was different. Nobody was special. He treated us all alike. He expected us to do the best we could. You know, and if, like, uh, the top runner did a 14 uh, or 13-minute three-mile race, he'd shake their hand and congratulate them. And if I, on the JV, team ran like a 19 minute race, he'd do the same thing. He'd shake my hand and said, great race. So he never made judgments of people. He never like worshiped the better athletes to the lesser athletes. He treated us all the same. And that's why I love my coach because he helped me get through a lot of difficulties in my life. He was there for me, you know, when my mom was sick, and my dad was uh, having some problems too. And I needed someone to talk to. And he, coach was there for me. And I will never forget that. I have so much gratitude for him. So of course I wanted to go to the reunion and see my class, my cross country teammates uh, and coach obviously and his family. And it was great. I had a wonderful time. Nobody judged me, nobody criticized me. In fact, they were happy for me, you know. They said I'm courageous and, you know, I'm humble, so I don't look at it as courageous, I just look at it as something I had to do, you know. But it took me a long time to get to that point, you know, for various reasons. But I was a little nervous, anxious how I would be received. And it was in an informal setting too. It was like at a picnic grounds. So it wasn't like you're sitting at tables and you're sitting with people who you went to high school with but you never really had relations with. And then it's probably awkward because they don't know what to say because, you know, they knew me as Eddie and now I'm Emily and that's totally different. I don't know how I would be received. I would assume they would be okay and accept me, but I don't know. And it's all moot anyway, because I'm having surgery in September and the reunion's in October. So it's less than a month and there's no way I'm going to be fully healed to go to an event in the city. Uh, and I don't think I could withstand the, the night there not because of the people, but because I'd still be in discomfort. So, I mean, I would love to go if I could, but it just seems like it's not gonna be possible. And one of the reasons why I wish I could go was because this is the 40th year anniversary. And even though I haven't seen these people, 
I've been in touch with them through Facebook, so we can still continue our friendship through Facebook. But I haven't seen some of these people for since we graduated high school. And some I have seen because I went to the 30 year reunion and I met some of my friends, but I was Eddie back then. But I went through a tragedy because that was the same year my dad committed suicide. So they knew and they were, and they were sad and they were hugging me and consoling me, you know, mostly girls though. Um, I'll just say first names, I won't say the full name, Janet and uh, Beth. They were very helpful to me. You know, they embraced me and uh, they were very nice to me. And if I was able to go to the 40th, I would seek them out, uh, both of them, Janet and Beth. Nice girls, nice women. And their moms, they have families, they're happily married, they're good people. Their kids are all grown up, college, finished. So if I went, I would seek people out like that. And I have other friends that I'm friends with that I would want to talk to. But the cross-country reunion was like different than what this, I believe, will be. Because uh, it was on picnic grounds, you know, you did a lot of walking, you sat at a picnic bench table, and you talked. I talked to the girlfriends of some of my cross-country teammates. They were very nice. You know, they were happy for me. They even said I looked pretty, which makes me happy. Because it took me a long time to get to that point where I could look at myself in the mirror and say, I, I think I look pretty good, you know? It took me a really long time to get to that point, you know? And I still want my hair to grow out again like I had it before, you know? And I like wearing dresses, what can I say? You know, I went 50 years with hiding it, wearing dresses underneath businessmen's suits. So now I shed the businessmen's suits and I only wear the dresses. And I'm no longer afraid, no longer hiding. I'm just living to be who I am as a person. And there's nothing wrong with that. Just like there's nothing wrong with anybody who's got a, on the LGBT spectrum, or who's on the autistic spectrum, or is disabled, or is a minority. There's nothing wrong with them. They're good people, just like everybody else, you know? And that's why I hate this. Uh, administration because they are saying that these people shouldn't be here they are kicking transgender people out of the military they're uh, putting little kids in prison camps and separating them from their parents I mean what's going on in this country I never seen America like this it's crazy and we have a leader who wants to be a dictator you know, I, I just don't get it. And I'm tired of politics, and tired of this BS. You know, I just wish that guy would go away. The sooner the better. And this Pence guy too, can't take them. But I can't let that bother me. I, I Otherwise I'll be sick and I just can't afford that. So I'm just trying to live my life, trying to find my happiness and trying to go through this process, you know, and just because I have surgery doesn't mean it's the end of the transition, because I'll be transitioning for the rest of my life. I'll be having to dilate for the rest of my life, you know. Uh, one of the reasons why trans women, like I said, have to dilate is to prevent their vaginal uh, canal from closing up. And if they want to have sex with men, they need to have that experience of, uh, you know, like, uh, I don't know, like you, you're putting it in and then like when you have sex as a male, I mean as a woman to with a man, you know what goes on. 
so I guess they need to have that simulation, which that's not my uh, cup of tea. Um, I just, you know, I just want to be me. You know, I'm a very shy person anyway, you know, and I'm not really into uh, small talk. That's why I don't know if it's such a great idea if I was able to go to the 40-year reunion because I'm not good at small talk. I don't want to be the center of attention, and I don't think I would be anyway. Most people would probably avoid me, you know, they don't want to deal with me. And I don't want to be an oddity, you know. I don't want people to think I'm, oh, there's that, that uh, girl that used to be a guy. I don't need that nonsense, you know. I would think that most of my classmates and I maybe shouldn't be criticizing because maybe they're all kind and they are happy for me, just like my cross-country teammates were. So, you know, and I don't like to judge and I don't like to be judged negatively. You know, if it's constructive criticism, I'm fine with that. But if it's downright meanness, where they criticize you and call you names and all, I don't like that. But, you know, this is a long time coming. It's less than a month away now, September 10th. I have a lot of things on my mind. I'm hoping that everything will work out and everything will be successful, no complications. And I have a good surgeon. I believe he's going to work uh, with a Russian uh, surgeon who's supposed to be an expert in uh, transgender surgery, primarily male to female transgender surgery. And Dr. Perwitt also is an uh, expert in male to female transgender surgery. And he, uh, the Russian guy, I'm not sure, but Dr. Perlitt and Dr. Jess Ting learned under the guidance of Dr. Marcy Bowers, who is a world-renowned uh, surgeon for transgender surgeries, specifically male to female surgeries and she also happens to be a male to female transgender woman too and she's a surgeon one of uh highly ranked surgeons so any doctor who's associated with her and follows her surgical plan uh, i feel very comfortable with so that's why i'm very comfortable with dr perlitt you know, and I trust him, and I know that uh, he cares for me. You know, he was upset when I had to cancel out the, the last time, but he held out hope that I would come around, and I did, and he was so happy. So we're both happy, and uh, it's not that far away. As it gets closer, I'll be more anxious, I bet but I'll be relieved when it's all done. And I'll finally say, wow, I had these five opportunities to do it and they never worked out, but finally it worked out, you know? And I guess psychologically it would be nice if I heard one of the doctors or nurses say, congratulations, you're now a woman. Um, but I've always been a woman. You know, it doesn't matter what you have below. It's what's up here. But just to know that you had the surgery and now you resemble a woman completely, your body's totally feminized, and they say, you're a wo congratulations, you're a woman, that will mean a lot to me, you know, because of my struggle, you know. But it doesn't diminish the fact that I'm a father to my son or a husband to my wife. I'm not going to relinquish that. And I haven't relinquished my male name either. You know, people say, well, how come you haven't changed your name yet legally to Emily? Because I think psychologically I wouldn't want to change my name because my parents gave me that name. And although I informally introduced myself as Emily, any paperwork I do, any tax returns I file, any... Uh, 
life insurance policies I have, any social security benefits I get paid, it's all in my male name. And if I change it legally now to Emily, it's going to be very confusing. And I don't need to have all that confusion, you know? You know? And uh, um, the only thing I think where it would be a little bit embarrassing is... Uh, well, when I was in the hospital, um, some people knew that even though my name is Edward Ionelli, they would call me Emily because they knew because I've been in the hospital many times. But in some instances where somebody didn't know me and they would call out the lunch or breakfast or dinner trays when I was in the hospital, they would say Edward Ionelli. And I hear people say, who's that? And then I have to quietly say, I go by Emily. And they say, oh, okay. So it's kind of embarrassing because I try to be under the radar when I'm in the hospital. I don't like to tell people I'm transgender. I just like, unless I really feel close to someone. But that's my business, you know. And at the hospital, they always give me a private room at the psych hospital because, you know, I'm transgender. And, you know, they can't, pair me with another girl and they can't pair me with a guy either so they just give me my own room so I guess that I'm a little bit different from other trans women where they have a big deal over changing names they have a big deal about the surgery and that they can finally have sex with men where I don't care about that they have a big deal that they uh, can enhance their breast size through uh, breast augmentation surgery and I'm happy just the way I am the hormones work and uh, some of them even go as far as facial feminization surgery and I've had thought about that but when I saw the price in doing that uh, I, I, I couldn't afford it, and they don't accept insurance anyway. Spiegel, Dr. Spiegel, is the expert. He's in Massachusetts. He practices with his wife, and they both are involved in the same field. And basically, they do facial feminization surgeries. They do vocal cord surgeries, and they do tracheal shaves, like to make the Adam's apple less prominent. But I don't have that problem. When I was in high school, I did. But for whatever reason, it's not there anymore. Or you can't see it. It's there, but you can't see it. And I believe it's attributed to the hormones. Because my skin is so much softer. And even around where the Adam's apple normally is seen, my skin is very smooth. So maybe the smoothness of the skin kind of covers it. So I don't know, but that's what it seems like. So I'm getting ready for surgery. I'm trying to get all my car, car um, things in order before I do go because I'm not going to be accessible for like a week. So I want to make sure I get that completed. I'm afraid that I still may owe on the car loan, which is going to really be a pain. You know, it's not like I did this deliberately. It was an accident. And I feel that it was something mechanical. But I have said it so many times, I'm getting tired of it. But uh, I have the trauma still. I have nightmares. You know, I take sedatives to try to ease my mind. And, uh... I'm having uh, surgery in less than a month, so I'm looking forward to it. You know, I have a car, which I never thought I would have a car like so quickly, but I'm afraid the insurance rates will go higher. I don't know. Everything comes with implications financially. My mortgage went up 300. My insurance 
with the new car and then the total loss score coming off is now $150 more. And who knows when it gets up for evaluation, how much it goes up. If it goes up like another four or $500, then I can't afford it. I can't afford the insurance. And certainly if I can't afford the insurance and I can't pay it, I'm gonna have to return the car, the lease, because I just can't afford it. And you can't have a car uninsured. And I don't believe I'm gonna get any better rates with it other insurance companies because of this accident even though it wasn't my fault they're going to blame someone and uh, most likely they're going to say it's not mechanical failure but uh, I was in the car I know exactly what happened so if I had to go to court and swear on a stack of Bibles I would say that my accelerator jammed on me I couldn't break the brake wouldn't slow the car down and the only way I could uh, avoid a catastrophic accident was to swerve not knowing where the hell I was going to wind up, not knowing if my car was going to flip over, swerving at a 40 mile an hour clip, making a hard right turn to avoid the car in front of me, and hitting a curb. Luckily I didn't flip over, but I did hit the curb and then it went airborne, and then I... Uh, went towards trees and I thought this is it I had a picture of my son in my mind and I'm thinking this is it you know this is how I'm gonna go um, and I'm not being over dramatic but I was lucky to walk away from it despite the fact that the car is totaled beyond totaled so I guess there's a reason I'm here for my son and God didn't want me to die before my transgender surgery. That's the only thing I can come up with. I'm here for my son, and I believe that God is uh, accepting of me being transgender, knowing that I've struggled all my life, and he wouldn't take me away without being uh, uh, a woman. So, you know, maybe I'm fantasizing, I don't know. But maybe that's the reason I'm still here, who knows. And the fact that surgery is only less than a month away. So, I'm kind of getting used to these long-winded videos. I hope my voice is getting more interesting. Uh, I hope I'm helping out other transgender people, you know. Because I want to try to help people. You know, I'm not a doctor. I'm not a psychiatrist, a therapist. I'm just Eddie or Emily, uh, a transgender woman who wants to kind of share her experiences and maybe help somebody. You know, you can leave comments, you know, you can subscribe to me. I'm an easygoing person. If you have any questions, please ask, you know. I'm not doing this for vanity. I'm just trying to share my own experiences. Plus, it helps me psychologically, too, you know. Sometimes they talk about autism, which my son doesn't like, but I'm affected by it, as is he. I'm affected by depression, suicide, uh, autism, being transgender, having bipolar disorder, having parents with mental illness. Uh, my dad committed suicide. I already said that. Uh, my cousin with his drug abuse dying prematurely. I'm my nephew, and then my cousin committing suicide. So I have a lot of things to talk about. You know, and I, I want to talk about happy things too. Now I want to talk about what I feel like after surgery. You know, I want to kind of give like uh, updates. Uh, no graphic things, just updates. Speaking about things, you know. And, uh, 
hoping that life will be okay, you know. You know, I'm going through some trials and tribulations, you know. I'm not completely happy with my situation that I, I, I'm like out of the job market and I've been out for a long time. And it's not like I don't want to work, but I'm pigeonholed because I work, uh, or when I worked, I was stressed out. I didn't like the treatment that I got. You know, I wasn't a very aggressive person. Though I was, you know, loyal, hardworking, competent, good qualities, loyal, reliable. Um, but when I came out as trans, it's like all that went out the window, you know? And people say, why didn't you sue? And what am I gonna say, how am I gonna sue? How can I prove that it was discrimination? You know, how? You know, they might have fired me for cause that they believe was cause, but I didn't know why they would, because I can't think of anything that they would fire me over, because I didn't file a report uh, two weeks sooner than the due date, when I had enough time to file it before the due date, and they, she gets mad at me when I'm doing other things, and then the nerve of them to get mad at me when they didn't even set me up with a phone. I had to like literally ask them every day, when am I gonna get a phone? It's very hard to call out if you have questions to people. So I knew right from the start it was gonna be a terrible experience, you know? And uh, the owner spoke to me the very first day and that was it. And then the very last day, well, no, the next, before I fainted, the day before, so, and he insults me and says, oh, so now you gotta go back to work as a man, right? And I said, I'm transgender, you're a medical doctor, you may be a pediatrician, but you have no idea what transgender means. You know, I wanted to set him straight, and I felt like cursing him out, but I didn't. You know, because you're supposed to show respect. But he was responsible for letting me go. And he pretended, oh, I'm so sorry it didn't work out. Like he's the one that wanted me to stay. That's such a, such a lie. You know, and they don't realize what they did to me mentally and emotionally. And why I had to go to the hospital so many times. And why I had to liquidate all my uh, retirement monies to prevent us from being thrown out of our house and living in the streets, you know? I worked hard all my life. I worked 30 years, and I'm still afraid of losing my house. You know, what the hell is life supposed to be about? Is it supposed to be like that? Is that why people commit suicide? You know? I mean, what kind of a world is this? I've read a tragic story about a poor Japanese girl and I did videos, if you want to check out my video, look at Junko for two, for Taro or something like that. For You want to hear a tragedy, you read her story, and then you get back to me and you'll see what I'm talking about. Junko, Junko, her last name starts with F, for Tudo, for Taro or something, but her first name is Junko. She's Japanese and she died over 30 years ago to torture. So you want to see someone who suffered 44 days of torture by a bunch of monsters, kids, 17 year old boys, who I can't even identify as human, what, what they did to that poor girl. Yeah, you check out that video. I did a few of them and how I was so emotionally upset about that, so. I just don't like seeing horrible things happening in life. Life is supposed to be beautiful, it's supposed to be a gift. And why would this beautiful 17 year old Japanese girl have to go through 44 days of torture until her body gave up and she died? It's horrendous. Go watch the video, you'll see what I'm talking about. Or look her up on the internet, Junko. 
Japanese girl. They called her the cement encrusted girl because after they tortured her, then they buried her in cement. And then uh, it took six months before the police could find out where she was. Just disgusting. I don't know what this world is coming to. But uh, I'm worried about Matthew. I'm going to have surgery soon. Worried about the car situation. Worried about the mortgage. Worried about paying all my bills, just like anybody else. You know, I'm tired of being a slave to all of this. I just want to find peace. You know, if this is considered paradise, uh, I don't think so. I want to go to heaven. That's paradise. This is hell. Well, I'm being over dramatic, but this is not uh, fun and games. This is hard. This is sadness, tragedy. We all know we're going to die. We all see it when our parents die. We all see it when our friends die or our classmates die. So we are all going to die. We don't know when we're going to die. The only ones who know when they're going to die are the ones that commit suicide. They take fate into their own hands. But if we live, we don't know when we're going to die. We don't know how we're going to die. I thought I was going to die three weeks ago or two weeks ago. I don't remember when my car lost control like it did. And I had no idea where I was going. Uh, all I knew is I had to avoid the car in front of me and swerve and not know where the hell I was going to go. I was bracing to die, you know. So we all know we're going to die. We just don't know when. And I'm just like, really? You know, I, I just don't get mentality of people because they live as if every day they're going to survive. They live as if they're never going to die, you know, and they're bragging about all the money they have. They're bragging about the houses they have, one in Florida, one in New York, one in Pennsylvania. Brag, 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 brag. Well, I have news for you. When you're dead, you don't take that with you. But your, your uh, children will benefit. And I wish I had that to provide for my son. Unfortunately, I'm on the, the lower end of uh, society. Even though I worked hard my whole life, 30 years. 30 years, and where did I go? Got sick mentally because of people who are haters, and I'm sick of that. I did this video to celebrate the fact that I'm having surgery, but life can be difficult. I'm sorry for my anger. I'm sorry for my bitterness. But I'm not that cute little girl that you see smiling in pictures. Because I have a lot of anxiety, I have a lot of stress, I have a lot of fear, and this is me, this is the true me. This is the me who gets angry, this is the me that lets loose, this is the me that curses out when I need to curse out someone, you know? This is the me that expresses my hatred for the President of the United States. I never hated a President in all my life. But this one takes the cake, man. I cannot stand him. But I just want to live my life as best I can. I want to be happy, you know. Um, I've witnessed tragedy. I lived through tragedy. One of my best friends who I did a tribute for growing up didn't even get these 40 years of life. We're having our 40 year high school reunion and he died 17. So he died 40 years ago and here I'm 58 and I've experienced 40 years that he never experienced. And that's sad. And I don't understand why things like that have to happen. Or with that Japanese girl, 17 also. 
to be tortured to death for 44 days. I don't understand these things. I really don't. And then for transgender people, kicked out of the military in the United States because of a stupid tweet by a moronic white supremacist, heartless, narcissistic, evil person who I don't even want to address as a person. So this world is not a perf perfect place, you know. You can pretend it is, but it's not. Uh, so, that's it for now. My surgery is in uh, September, September 10th. I'm going to my doctors today for a uh, laser for down below. I'm also going to my social worker. Uh, then I have to go next week for evaluation and then I go to my therapist and then I go to my psychi psychiatrist And then I uh, go for surgery. And then I have like a week before I go to see the surgeon for a follow-up. And then I will be back and explain everything that happened. So I'm pre-op. And my endocrinologist said, who's pregnant, and I congratulated her. This is her first baby she's expecting. Uh, and she's actually due in September. So it would be funny if I had my surgery and her baby's birth were on the same day. But uh, she's very helpful to me. She's very supportive. She knows my story, and I think she's awesome. And uh, I wished her good luck, and she wished me good luck, and she scheduled me an appointment, and she said, I'll see you on the other side. And you know what that means. I'm male, but on the other side, I'll be female. And that's all wanting a healthy child and uh, a good life. I would say this is the third thing, well, with a wife and a, my son. And then this would be uh, up there as uh, finally becoming a woman, fully. And not just mentally, but now anatomically. So. It's not that far away. The only thing I'm worried about a little bit is the pain. But I believe I can handle that. So I'll, I'll, I'll be in touch. Don't you worry. Thank you.